Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. History as it happens, May 21st, 2024. The British Mandate. Against all principle, the British government imposed the Belfort Declaration, which is abhorred by all Arabs in the Near East. The map shows what partition means. The Jewish state colored light, the Arab state dark, Jaffa to go to the Arabs, Jerusalem international. Saudi Arabia? No. Soviet Union? Yes. United Kingdom? Abstain. The United States, yes. But Jerusalem itself has troubles too. Riots are reported daily from various parts of the city. British police search for arms in a country where in just over a month, nearly 40 people have been killed in the disturbances. British rule in Palestine from around 1920 to 1948 laid the groundwork for decades of conflict between Jews and Arabs. By supporting Zionist immigration, the British fueled Arab grievances, provoking communal violence and ever greater determination by each side to get its way. A peaceful resolution wasn't possible then, and it's not possible today, says historian Tom Segev. He's next as we report history as it happens. A podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. I have come to the conclusion after many years that it is a conflict that does not have a solution. Once I reached that conclusion, I remembered that David Ben-Gurion, the founder of Israel, said exactly that in 1919. That is to say, for over a hundred years ago, there is a gap between Jews and Arabs, and that gap cannot be overcome. As I was putting this episode together, news broke that the prosecutor for the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, is requesting arrest warrants for three Hamas leaders and Israel's prime minister and defense minister for alleged war crimes. The crimes include starvation of civilians as a method of warfare, willfully causing great suffering, serious injury to body or health or cruel treatment, willful killing or murder, and intentionally directing attacks against a civilian population. Those were the charges against the Israelis. Here are the charges against the leaders of Hamas. Extermination as a crime against humanity. Murder as a crime against humanity and as a war crime. The taking of hostages as a war crime. Rape and other acts of sexual violence during captivity as crimes against humanity and as war crimes. The ongoing war is as brutal and destructive as any fought between Jews and Arabs. In an essay titled Israel's Forever War and Foreign Affairs, the official publication of the Council on Foreign Relations, historian Tom Segev writes, To Israelis, October 7th, 2023 is the worst day in their country's 75-year history. Never before have so many of them been massacred and taken hostage on a single day. Segev goes on to say, for Palestinians, the Gaza war is the worst event they've experienced in 75 years. Never have so many of them been killed and uprooted since the Nakba, the catastrophe that befell them during Israel's War of Independence in 1948, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forced to give up their homes and became refugees. Now, violence existed between Jews and Arabs well before 1948, almost immediately after the First World War, when British authorities took control of Palestine, which had not been a distinctive administrative entity during the Ottoman era, Arabs and Jews clashed over the land. And as Segev points out in his essay, it was apparent then that peaceful coexistence was unlikely, if not impossible. As early as 1919, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's future first prime minister, recognized that there could be no peace in Palestine, Segev writes. Both the Jews and the Arabs, Ben-Gurion observed, were claiming the land for themselves, and both were doing so as nations. There is no solution to this question, he repeatedly declared. There is an abyss between us, and nothing can fill that abyss. The inevitable conflict, Ben-Gurion concluded, could it best be managed, limited or contained, perhaps, but not resolved. 
I'll share a paywall-free link to Segev's foreign affairs piece in my weekly newsletter. You can sign up at historyasithappens.com or find History As It Happens on Substack. So, as you know, since October 7th, 2023, we've been talking about the origins of today's war or today's battle in a long war going back a century. I've done episodes about Hamas, the history of Gaza, Harry Truman's decision to recognize the new state of Israel in 1948. Today, we're going to look at the British Mandate, a time when the seeds of conflict were planted. Jerusalem has long been the focal point of the still unsolved problem of Palestine. Although in times of comparative peace, Jews and Arabs live side by side and go about their business in the old city of Jerusalem with apparent calm, beneath the surface, bitter enmity has continued to smolder for years. From William Cleveland's A History of the Modern Middle East, the San Remo Conference of 1920 awarded Britain the mandate for Palestine, and the military government was replaced by a civilian administration. Two years later, the newly created League of Nations gave formal sanction to the mandate and added provisions that raised Zionist expectations and alarmed the Arab inhabitants. The terms of the League mandate incorporated the Balfour Declaration and recognized Hebrew as an official language in Palestine. The appointment of Sir Herbert Samuel as civilian high commissioner in 1920 offered further encouragement to the Zionists. Samuel was Jewish and an ardent Zionist, and he interpreted his task as facilitating the establishment of the Jewish national homeland. Now, the British Mandate did not recognize the Arabs' national rights or sovereignty, even though in 1919 the King Crane Commission, named after scholar Henry Churchill King, along with the businessman Charles R. Crane, was dispatched by Woodrow Wilson to survey the Arabs. It found significant support for the creation of a unified Syrian state, which would include in its borders present-day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine-slash-Israel. King and Crane wanted such a state to take the form of a constitutional monarchy along democratic lines, to be ruled by the Hashemite Amir Faisal. So this was not an independent Palestine, but it wasn't a Jewish state either. The commission survey was ignored, as we all know. And instead, as mentioned, in 1922, the League of Nations formally gave the British control over Iraq and Palestine and the French, Syria and Lebanon. It did not take long for blood to be spilled. Already in 1920, a riot had left five Jews and four Arabs dead after Muslim leaders made speeches denouncing the Balfour Declaration at an annual procession from Jerusalem to Nebi Musa. The Arabs never accepted the Balfour Declaration. I've played this clip in a prior episode. It is worth listening to again. An unnamed Arab man in 1936 in a British Pathé newsreel explaining Arab grievances against the British. A policy which, if continued, will surely have as a result the replacement of the Arabs by the Jews. This policy is not only contrary to the pledge given by His Britannic Majesty's government to the late King Hussein in the year 1915 for the establishment of a completely independent state, but is also not in accordance with the fourth point of President Wilson's 14 points calling for the self-determination of all people. During the 1920s and 30s, the British pitted Palestine's Arabs against one another, while encouraging more Jewish emigration. This balancing act, if you want to call it that, proved impossible to sustain. In 1923, the British did propose creating a legislative council with 22 members, more Arabs than Jews, because the Arabs did make up a large majority of the population. The Jews wanted equal representation, Arabs boycotted the elections, and no council was ever formed. In 1929, a disturbance occurred that helps explain the sensitivity, the volatility of a conflict informed by religious and nationalist zealotry. The Wailing Wall Disturbances of 1929. William Cleveland writes, Although Jews had the right to visit the wall, they were not allowed to set up chairs, benches, or screens to separate men and women during prayer. The British, in keeping with their policy of maintaining the status quo in religious matters, agreed that these restrictions should remain in effect. However, Jewish activists constantly challenged the regulations, and in late 1928, the British police found it necessary to forcibly remove from the area a screen and the worshippers who had placed it there. The intensity of Jewish objections to this action galvanized the Mufti and the Supreme Muslim Council into launching a publicity campaign about the danger that Zionism posed to the holy places of Islam. In 
A year of claims and counterclaims over the status of the wall turned into violent confrontations in August 1929, during which Arab mobs, provoked by Jewish demonstrations, attacked two Jewish quarters in Jerusalem and killed Jews in the towns of Hebron and Safad. By the time British forces quelled the riots, 133 Jews and 116 Arabs had lost their lives. In the 1930s, large waves of Jewish immigrants arrived from Germany and Eastern Europe and began setting up the foundations for a future state, the Jewish Agency, communal settlements, or kibbutz. And by 1936, the Arabs revolted. Unrest in Palestine, suspecting that the higher committee had incited Arab leaders to start a holy war against the British government, police swooped on the secret headquarters of assassins and rebels. Many arrests were made. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Head of the Muslim Supreme Council was deprived of office. Many other high officials were taken on board the cruiser Sussex, deported to an island in the Indian Ocean. In Palestine itself, the frontiers are guarded with special vigilance. All roads leading to Jerusalem patrolled. Troops which should have left for other That states same year, 1936, the British sent the Peel Commission to Palestine to figure out why Arabs were so unhappy and to suggest a solution. A two-state solution, a partition, after World War II, after months of deliberations, the United Nations in 1947 voted to partition the land into a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, with Jerusalem under international control. The Arabs boycotted. Civil war ensued. And throughout the war, the British administration made little effort to enforce order, concentrating instead on preparations for its withdrawal. On May 14, 1948, in the midst of the turmoil, the last British High Commissioner, General Alan Cunningham, quietly departed from Haifa. As one eyewitness recalled the moment, the Union Jack was lowered, and with the speed of an execution and the silence of a ship that passes in the night, British rule in Palestine came to an end. There had been no formal transfer of powers from the Mandate Authority to a new local government for the simple reason that there was no government of Palestine. Britain had failed to create political institutions in its mandate, instead leaving the Arab and Jewish communities to struggle for supremacy, as William Cleveland writes. And it was the Jewish groups who were better prepared to take control of a state. Historian Tom Segev is the author of One Palestine Complete, Jews and Arabs Under the British Mandate, and A State at Any Cost, The Life of David Ben-Gurion, among many books he's written as a leading scholar of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Tom Segev, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Joining us from Israel, and uh, your essay in Foreign Affairs was one of the best that I've read since uh, October 7th of last year. And it reminded me what one of my old politics professors at Ithaca College once told me about conflict. And that is, sometimes there are no good outcomes. We can debate possible good outcomes as people, but if we're going to recognize the reality and why certain conflicts have not been resolved, well, then maybe there really are no good outcomes. Is that what you're saying here? I have come to the conclusion after many years that it is a conflict that does not have a solution. Once I reached that conclusion, I remembered that David Ben-Gurion, the founder of Israel, said exactly that in 1919. That is to say, for over 100 years ago, there is a gap between Jews and Arabs, and that gap cannot be overcome. It cannot be solved, but it can be managed. And uh, Ben-Gurion himself managed it pretty well. For example, when in 1948, he decided that the Israeli army will not occupy the West Bank and uh, East Jerusalem and Gaza. Why? Because it was already populated by the refugees, uh, the Palestinian refugees. So Ben-Gurion says, we have just gotten rid of them. Why would we, we occupy them again? Once the territories were occupied in 1967, Ben-Gurion himself lost his senses. I uh, knew him with uh, two friends for the student newspaper of the Hebrew University, also the Israeli Independence Day, the 20th Independence Day was coming up. Unbelievable, this is over 50 years ago. He said to us, in exchange for peace, I am giving the Arabs back the territories, which we have just occupied. And I was a very young journalist, not experienced enough to ask him, Mr. Ben-Gurion, does that include Jerusalem? 
And of course, he doesn't. In fact, within a very short time, he demanded that the wall around the old city be uh, torn down in order to demonstrate the unity of, of the town. So no, Jerusalem, no. Why not? What does it give us, Jerusalem? It doesn't give us anything, but it's something of the, of the heart, of the soul, of the feeling, of the mythology, of belief. In fact, when the government decided to occupy East Jerusalem, this is really interesting, there is not a single cabinet minister who says to his colleagues, listen, guys, why is it good for us to occupy East Jerusalem? They occupied it because it was possible. It's a decision from the guts, from the heart. It's not a decision from, from the head. And so I'm saying that throughout the history of the conflict, on both sides, the Palestinian side and the Israeli side, there are elements which are irrational by definition. So what we have here, in fact, is a conflict between two national identities. Both peoples define their national identity by the land. And so each compromise would mean that every side has to give up elements of its national identity. Well, you say here in your essay, from its beginnings, the conflict has always been perpetuated by religion and mythology. Violent fundamentalism and messianic prejudices, fantasies and symbols, and deep-rooted anxieties, rather than by concrete interests and calculated strategies. But from the Israeli perspective, managing it means keeping the Palestinians in a permanent state of limbo, statelessness. And that's really not managing it. Since 1967, that's the situation. Yes, that is a situation uh, that came as a result of an irrational mood, unbelievable feeling of salvation uh, following the victory in 1967 in the Six Day War. At the beginning, there was some talk about this compromise or that compromise, but over the years, the uh, forces in Israel, the right wing, if you want, religious, nationalistic, very often racist elements became stronger. The oppression of the Palestinians became worse from year to year. And one of your uh, more trenchant observations, you say here, you know, since the late 80s, early 90s and the development of uh, the Oslo peace process, you talk about ambitious peace plans that have been floated over the decades by outside mediators, namely the United States. But you also say they all fail to contend with the inability of the Israelis and the Palestinians themselves to embrace a lasting solution. Your outlook here is, is pretty pessimistic. These peace plans are almost a waste of time. In hindsight, it was a waste of time. But yes, I praise uh, everybody who tried. You know, every American president since at least since Johnson tried to find some kind of uh, solution. And uh, there are peace plans and roadmaps and this and that. It never worked because the irrational elements always take over. And so, yes, I am very pessimistic today more than ever before. So if this conflict was inevitable, as Ben-Gurion believed it was, given the, the set of circumstances at the time and the nature of Zionist settlement in that part of the world and also how the Arabs felt about it, if this conflict was inevitable, it makes our task here of considering possible alternative outcomes pretty difficult. I, mean, I tend to avoid counter-historical speculation, but I do want to discuss with you the British mandate, why things turned out the way they did. A lot of it does have to do with the way the British ruled this part of the world from the early 1920s to 1947. So I want to begin with the significance of the King Crane Commission. This is before the British establish their mandate. The King Crane Commission was a survey that was sent to this part of the world, not just Palestine, most of the Arab Middle East, right, to survey Arabs as to what they wanted after World War I. Uh, what were the findings and why were they significant? Listen, this is uh, 
one commission in an endless row of commissions. Somebody once said that if you take the reports of all commissions and put them one on the other near the uh, King David Hotel in Jerusalem, it will reach the roof of the of the hotel. I don't want to offend any hi- history teachers who might be among our uh, listeners, but at least my history teachers always tried to find historical explanations for for everything. And so when we talked about the British in Palestine, we were told that uh, the British uh, need Palestine uh, in order to defend the Suez Canal and defend the way to India and uh, maybe Arab oil and all kinds of explanations. But when I um, read some of the discussions they had, I was quite stunned by the strength of the irrational drives of, of, for example, uh, Lord Balfour. That is so striking because British archives abound with reports and letters and statements warning the government in London, mostly written by army generals in Egypt, warning the government in in London, do not enter Palestine, stay out of Palestine. Now, governments do not always agree with the army, and so it's legitimate that they will enter Palestine. Fine. On the one hand, they believed, like anti-Semites very often do, that the Jews ruled the world. We have to support the Jews because the Jews rule the world. They are the ones who rule the, 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 the media and the finance, the banking, and they are the ones who will decide whether or not the United States uh, enters the war or not. And so we need the Jews as friends. But at the same time, they were also very, very supportive of Jews, the Jews who belong to the Holy Land. The whole, the, this is all the old history. The noble people who, who want nothing more than go back to the country. And the man like Balfour wants to be remembered as the man who actually made that prophecy come true. I am the one who will bring the Jews, the people of the Bible, bring them back to the Holy Land. This is a well-known stream of thought in England. And so this is a combination of philo-Semitism and anti-Semitism. They were both supporting the Jews, helping the Jews, admiring the Jews, and they were afraid of the Jews and very often hated the Jews. And this combination, I think, is a very strong explanation for the fact that they publicly declared, the British government publicly declared its support for the Zionist dream, for the establishment of a Jewish homeland, as they called it. They didn't call it state yet but they said homeland in Palestine. And this makes absolutely no sense in, in, in terms of, of real, real interests. And for the next 30 years, they were mature enough to break it. And very soon they started to look for ways out. So that would explain why the results of the King Crane Commission were ignored. Uh, at least one explanation, because that commission came back finding that the Arabs wanted to create an independent Syrian state where neither Lebanon or Palestine would have a separate existence. How would you describe what this Syrian state would have looked like? Uh, It wasn't a democracy, right? It would have been some kind of monarchy? I don't really know what may have happened. I think that uh, it made sense for the British to support the Arabs and not the Zionists. It goes so far, by the way, not on, only Balfour was this kind of Christian Zionist, also David Lloyd George. And David Lloyd George published his memoirs, and he explains how strong the Jews were. Now, maybe he thought that in 1917, but by 1913, it, 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 in the middle of the 1930s, no one in his, in his senses still thought that the Jews of Europe have, have any power to... And, and so... This is, this is quite quite amazing how the Jewish communities were destroyed one after the other, and he's, he's still talking about the power of, of the Jewish people. So the mandate system, this was supposed to be a, a midway point between independence or autonomy for Arabs and complete control by an outside European state. Is that right? I mean, the mandate was supposed to eventually lead to independence for Palestine. 
or a Jewish homeland in Palestine. This is a time when, when big powers uh, establish all kinds of presence in other countries, but it was not too compared, for instance, with India, to the colonies in Africa or, or something like that. It's a special kind of presence meant to be temporary from, from the start, decided by the League of Nations. What was the British administration like in Palestine? I mean, there was a high commissioner, Sir Herbert Samuel, but did they have a large bureaucracy or a, a large armed presence of British troops there? They first had a large bureaucracy. The arms came later. They behaved as if they are somewhere in England, playing uh, uh, football and having tea parties, inviting each other, written invitations sent from one side of the street to the other. Very soon, the Jews accused the British of being pro-Arab. The Arabs accused them of being pro-Jewish. In reality, I think the Jews made more of their presence, realized that this is a, a unique situation which they can use for their, for their purposes. For instance, in, in terms of education, the British supposedly did not change anything. So there was no compulsory education in Palestine. The Jews introduced education for everybody. And so by the time the wars broke out, this was an a much better trained army, but a higher educational level. And the the Arabs, particularly the, the girls, could not read and write. And there are many, many other examples of that. The Jews were laying the infrastructures for their state, social infrastructure, economic infrastructure, the, the military, the Jewish community, was basically a European community and uh, benefited from European culture. And so by the time the war comes, these are two sides which culturally, there is a gap between them. The Jews benefited more from the British presence than, than the Arabs. The Palestinian Arabs, they were involved in Ottoman administration for a quite a long time, and they had some prominent families. So I guess some people might be wondering, why weren't they able to establish the fundaments of a future state during this time? Even if they succeeded in Ottoman administration, this would not be enough for a modern state in, in the 20th century. So this doesn't really mean anything. Okay. Uh, there was lots of corruption lots of uh, family politics, their basic values did not include liberal democracy. And there was a balancing act here, right? Have more Zionist immigration while also placating the Arab majority so that their rights would not be trampled in all of this. How quickly did that balancing act start to run into trouble? Basically, establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine also meant Jewish immigration. Uh, Jewish immigration was usually regulated in coordination between the Jewish establishment, the Jewish agency, and the British authorities. And so they usually agreed on how many people can enter the country every every month or, or, or every year. The Arab population also grew. Arabs also entered, entered Palestine. But Jews were better organized. When the Nazis came to power in, in Germany, about 50, 60, 70,000 Jews from Germany, which was the most advanced country in, in, in Europe. These were people with, with money and skills, and they began to contribute a lot. It also seems the Arab leadership was divided. I mean, you had a couple of prominent families from Jerusalem, the Husseinis and the Nashashibis. And the Nashashibis were a little bit more accommodating toward the British, but how did their rivalry inhibit a more unified and better Arab resistance to Zionist immigration? The Jews were also divided. Wherever you have people, you have politics, but Arab politics are much more passionate, much more violent, much less target-oriented. The family is everything. The head of the family is everything. They hate each other. They assassinate each other. And uh, the national future, say a Arab-Palestinian state, was very often, almost always, inferior 
to the interests of those uh, families and, and the family leaders. This also goes back to some differences in the religious attitude and, and approach. And the Jews were better organized and more determined towards the goal, ultimate goal of, of having, having a Jewish state. This is interesting. Ben-Gurion's Zionism means maximum Jews, minimum Arabs, and as much territory as possible, but by no means the entire country. So he really brought this idea with him that the Jewish majority, even on part of the land, is more important than occupying the entire land as they began to think after 1967. So until 1967, this is basically the principle. And the feeling was that the Arabs uh, can live with it. But of course, even taking parts of the land involved the displacement of the Arab population. And at some point here, the British tried to cut off Zionist immigration. After encouraging it, they eventually tried to stop it. Yes, not often, sometimes for a while. Every time there were some Arab riots or, or violence or something, the, f- the first reaction was, okay, let's stop immigration. And they made a bigger effort to stop immigration after World War II, which is particularly nasty, really, because here we are really talking about refugees. We are not talking about Zionist ideologues. Eventually, they all came. Some British high commissioners were really, really very pro-Jewish, very pro-Zionist. Others were not. There is one high commissioner, I think, who says, I loathe them both, the British and the Arabs. I'm neither pro-Jewish, neither pro-Arab. I am pro-British. And this is probably true for all of them, but they were different types and different years. For instance, when they made a great effort to suppress the Arab riots in the 1930s. During World War II, they were more more pro-Arab. The Arabs, in turn, many of them were pro-Nazi. So this is, uh, again, something which the British did not gain much from their position there. Hey, the Grand Mufti visited Hitler in 1942. That certainly didn't help matters. That was probably the most stupid things the Arabs could do in all those those years. He hoped to extract some kind of German Balfour declaration from Hitler. Hitler sent him away. But yes, this uh, photograph of the Mufti with, with Hitler is uh, part of the Israeli propaganda ever since. It is a very stupid thing. You know, it goes so far that Prime Minister Netanyahu the other day I think two years ago already, claimed that the idea to exterminate the Jews came to Hitler from Mufti during that meeting, as if he had not thought about it himself. This attack and others' attack, other attacks on the Jewish community in 1920, 1921, 1929, were uh, instigated by a call of the Mufti of Jerusalem, Khajamin al Husseini, who was later. Uh, sought for war crimes in the Nuremberg trials because he had a central role uh, in fomenting the uh, final solution. He flew to Berlin. Uh, Hitler didn't want to uh, exterminate the Jews at the time. He wanted to expel the Jews. And Haj Amin al-Husseini went to Hitler and said, if you expel them, they'll all come here. So what should I do with them, he asked. He said, burn them. He needed the Mufti to get the idea. That's today recognized by every Arab and and Arab historians and and everybody as a big mistake. Well, the thinking there may have been, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And in 1942, it's not entirely clear just yet the Allies are going to win. So, as you say, the Mufti throws in his lot with Hitler, hoping that he might get a better deal from the Germans. So, during this time... Were the Palestinian Arabs calling for a state of their own? Some probably did, but there was no national movement that made this as the major target. I think they regarded themselves as part of the Arab world somehow. Maybe Palestine 
in the old once meant Syria and Palestine together. But in the meantime, there was Jordan, Kingdom of Jordan, and that made things more complicated. What they mainly wanted was that the Jews will not have their own state. In addition to facilitating Zionist immigration, Jewish immigration to Palestine, what was the British interest there? Uh, was it geopolitical? Because as you said at the top of our, of our interview, it really wasn't in their interests to do this. It's probably an example of how even big and intelligent nations make mistakes. And in fact, at the latest in 1938 or something, they wanted out. And that's when they appointed another commission and another commission and another commission to advise them, so what do we do with Palestine? They recognized that the Balfour Declaration was a mistake. They couldn't just get out. There was always the fear that uh, the French, God forbid, will take it. So they were stuck there. It's, it's really interesting. They, they were just stuck there. And dealing with more and more violence between Jews and Arabs. Yes. You know, there was a time after 1967 when Israelis began to ask, what is my son doing in Hebron, in Gaza, in Jenin? Why are we even there? That's when, it, when lots of Israeli soldiers began to get killed there. And this is, this is interesting because when, when Ben-Gurion met with the uh, British foreign minister, he told him, you have no idea how many letters I get from British citizens telling me what is my son doing in Jenin? What is my son doing in Gaza? So, yes, what is he doing there? Eventually, they left when the days of the British Empire began to be over. You know, they had decided to leave India, the jewel of the crown, and Palestine was at best some kind of backyard. And so they also left Palestine. So there were some serious clashes in 1929. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the significance of that year, which uh, the historian Hillel Cohen calls uh, year zero in the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, 1929? Once in every few years, riots broke out, beginning in 1920, because it really starts with an irrational question. And the question is how to stage the prayers at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem? Should uh, the Jews be allowed to put up some kind of uh, barrier between men and women or between Jews and uh, whatever? Some technical question of the prayers in, on the Western Wall. And this then spread to other parts of the country from a local quarrel or, or fight. And, and in Hebron, Hundreds of people were killed, and the the British reacted very harshly, and this spread into the whole of the country, and eventually hundreds of, of Arabs were, were also killed. And so it's really very difficult. So you ask, why, 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 what, all of a sudden, why do you all of a sudden raise and, and kill your neighbor? A, a considerable number of, of Arabs also saved Jews from other Arabs, and the British police was not there. It was uh, very, very few soldiers and, and policemen. Nobody expected anything to happen. By the time they realized that this is a really big story, it was over. So in 1936, the Arabs revolted. This was crushed by the British, and it did have long-term implications for the Arabs' ability to resist what came later. What was the significance of the revolt in 1936? The significance is that it is a story of failure, of Arab failure. Nothing was, was gained, both militarily, politically. If there was some kind of national dream to get rid of the British and the Jews at the same time, it just failed. And yes, this was very soon to the end very soon to the big war of 1948. Not only were the Jews better trained, they were also participated in the British army fighting the Germans. And so many Jewish fighters in 1948 had military training, which they got 
in the British Army when the British agreed to take a number of, of Jewish fighters because they needed the manpower in their wars against Germany. This is interesting because the British really invested a lot of effort to crush the Arab rebellion. And very soon afterwards, the British became the enemy of the Jewish national uh, movement when began to fight the British, as if the British are the enemy. As I said before, Israel really owes its existence to the, to the British. But in the ninth, late 1930s and beginning of the 1940s, there was this atmosphere, this anti-British atmosphere, and uh, the British were compared with the Nazis. No one had anything good to say about them, which is uh, unfair, really, especially for, as I said, for the Jewish side, because Zionism really gained a lot from the presence of the British. To your point that you make in your essay that we're not going to get anywhere here if people continue to ignore the fundamental facts, that this conflict is intractable, inevitable, maybe unsolvable. It seems that the British administrators and London understood this problem. They continued to send commissions there to investigate what to do about it. So there's this commission in 1939, the Peel Commission, and it decides the only way out of this situation is to create one Arab state and one Jewish state. The Zionists were split over the Peel Commission. They weren't entirely happy with it, but they still were okay with at least getting something, right? The Arabs totally rejected it. Right. And uh, this is the first time anybody seriously suggested the two-state solution, which I think is impossible today as it was then, Uh, because both sides don't have enough to offer the other side, and there's no basis for an agreement. But there were many Jews who also objected. This is our land. Why why share it with the Arabs? So it's not only the Arabs who said we don't want to give anything. No, we why why should we share? But uh, wisely enough, they said, okay, we are we are happy to think about it. And Ben Gurion's attitude again is really interesting. When he read the Peel Commission report, he was not very happy about it because it requires partition. But then uh, the same evening he read it again. and and came across something which he had not noticed before, and that is that the British are suggesting that the Arabs in the Jewish state will be transferred to across the border. In in other words, the Jews were to get an almost empty piece of land, and this is what made Ben-Gurion really happy. He writes in his diary, forced transfer. The British very soon also came across that paragraph and, and put it out. And this is exactly what happened in 1948. The weakness of the Arab society is, of course, what made so many Arabs escape and make it uh, relatively easy to expel the, the others. The Arabs left, the Arabs escaped, the Arabs were forced to escape, and Arabs were also expelled. All these things happened in different points in time in different places. But at the end, then Gurion got something which he used to say that uh, he was dreaming about it as, as a boy of three years old. This is part of Palestine, but empty of Arabs, open for all Jews of the world to come and live there. Of course, they didn't. In the meantime, the Holocaust broke out, so nothing really turned out uh, the way the Zionist movement wanted it. The Arabs lost, and I think that to the present day, The Palestinians are the orphans of the Middle East. Historian Tom Segev joining us from Israel. And again, I will put a link to his essay in Foreign Affairs in my weekly newsletter. Sign up at historyasithappens.com. And if you have an idea for an episode or if you'd like to offer feedback, positive or negative, about this podcast, get in touch. My email is mdicaro, M-D-I, C-A-R-O at WashingtonTimes.com. New episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. Newsletter every Friday. This is a podcast from The Washington Times.